Good afternoon, everyone, and you're very welcome to this Ashley Ireland technical webinar. Uh, my name is Daniel Coakley, and I'll be chairing today's session. Um, so here's the agenda for today's webinar. Uh, I'll give a short introduction and cover some general housekeeping and um, information about the webinar before handing over to today's speaker, uh, Professor Jarek Konitsky. He's going to speak about the latest REVA guidance on ventilation as a means to prevent the spread of SARS-CoV-2 virus. Uh, afterwards, we should have around 10 minutes Q&A, uh, and I'll finish with some brief closing announcements. So before we begin, I just wanted to highlight a couple of points regarding participation in today's webinar. Um, as you'll have seen, all attendees are muted, but if you'd like to ask a question, please use the questions tab or the chat function to submit your query and we'll do our best to answer it during the webinar. You can also submit questions at any time uh, during, the, during the webinar. If you have any difficulty or you want to follow up afterwards, uh, email or email contact details have been provided. You can also access a PDF copy of today's presentations in the handouts tab and I'd suggest downloading these because We'll move quickly through some of the slides, and there's also some hyperlinks contained in those slides for further information. Uh, lastly, when the seminar is concluded, you'll receive a very short survey, and uh, we'd really appreciate your response on that. So we're delighted to have the opportunity to host Yarek for a second time uh, in the Ashley Ireland chapter. He previously spoke to us last September uh, as part of our COVID-19 mini-series alongside representatives from SIBC, ASHRAE and other experts in specialist topics such as monitoring, control and air cleaning. If you missed that seminar or any of the others, the recordings and slides are still available on the website or at the link shown below. And you can also subscribe to our YouTube channel to receive alerts as soon as we publish new videos. Uh, we've already had a couple of webinars since the start of this year and we'll be adding more over the coming weeks. For now, this is the lineup of upcoming events over the next few months. Uh, all of these events are free to attend and you can register using the links provided on the slide. Um, I previously highlighted some of the ASHRAE resources around COVID-19 and I I'm just including this slide as a reference for now. Uh, all of these resources are freely available to the public from ASHRAE. There's also a very useful infographic which ASHRAE provide help you navigate all of the resources that are available and I've included a copy of this um, in, the, in the slides so you can just open the PDF and uh, all of these uh, icons are interactive links to the relevant sections of ASHRAE guidance. Um, the ASHRAE Learning Institute also continues to run a range of courses which are available at the link provided on this slide and there is also upcoming HVAC uh, design and operations training um level one and level two um so at the moment this is being offered virtually and there are plans to um offer specific training for europe in june or july this year um so you'll be announcing that um in the in the coming weeks so now i'm going to hand over to today's speaker and i'm delighted to have the opportunity to welcome back uh, Jarek Grunitsky, a professor at Tallinn university of technology estonia and at alto university finland Jarek is chair of the Riva Technology and Research Committee and leads Riva's COVID-19 task force. Today he'll be speaking about the latest Riva guidance on ventilation as a means to prevent the spread of SARS-CoV-2 virus. So over to you, Jarek. Uh, I'll just make you presenter now. Well, thank you for a very nice introduction and um, uh, so now you should see my slides. Good afternoon for everybody. So this presentation is about RIFA guidance and I have divided this into four parts. So we'll start with, let's say, transmission routes and a bit about aerosol physics behind these to understand this correctly and when will go to this mainly ventilation-oriented technical solutions, how to reduce the spread of airborne viruses. 
Uh, when yes, um, some challenges and research items which we do not know yet very well, and that's the future challenge. And finally, about the infection probability, uh, calculation possibilities, and how this can be applied. So, um, starting with this let's say transmission routes, it's important to understand uh, what is the size of a virus, how it behaves, is it like a solid particle or what's the difference to the liquid particle and um, uh, that's very often you see uh, let's say this type of visualization which is not exactly correct so the right um, figure is much more correct where you can see a, a droplet and uh, some viruses inside that. So the size of a coronavirus is indeed very small. So it's um, about 100 nanometers, meaning uh, 0.1 micrometer. But it is important to understand that this virus is never naked. So it is in the respiratory fluid droplets we exhale or cough or sneeze so everything what is coming out of our mouth and nose will include these viruses if somebody is infected and we know that this um, virus will remain active up to three hours in the air and then can can be active more on room surfaces Uh, well, when depending on the size of a droplet, uh, behavior can be completely different. Uh, first, when we expel respiratory fluid droplets, when these are basically uh, liquid droplets, and the size of these will range from less than one micrometer to more than 100 micrometer, actually to up to somewhere one millimeter, so 1,000 micrometer. But um, this 100 micrometer is the diameter, which is the largest particle a human being can inhale. So this basically limits our range of interest. And uh, these large particles, as you can see on the figure, these will drop down will settle down very quickly. So uh, we account in seconds for uh, to settle down 1.5 meter, as you can see. But when we speak about one micrometer, three micrometer or 10 micrometer, when we uh, settle down the uh, times are in hours or in minutes. So that would take a very long time. So uh, and uh, these uh, smaller ones, there is no clear cutoff point, but typically uh, micrometers. And um, uh, when this, uh, as these are liquid droplets, a human being will exhale when it is important to understand uh, what's the evaporation and desiccation process in the air and basically this process is very fast so as an example 50 micrometer droplet will desiccate in about two seconds and 10 micrometer only in 0.1 second so it's quite an instant process and uh, after that, these droplets behave as solid particles. So basically, when we uh, described how these viruses uh, can, can be moved in the, by the airflows and so on, when we speak, uh, uh, everything will apply for solid particles. It's a movement of a solid particles. So uh, a common aerosol physics can be applied. And uh, this size, what we typically say 10 micrometer, and this, this is the size after that evaporation and desiccation process. 
So in that process, uh, these liquid particles will lose the size so that the final size is about one third or one fourth of initial diameter. Uh, and uh, initial diameter has basically no meaning because this process is so fast. We are interested about the size range of the final diameter of these droplets exhaled and that determines how they behave in indoor air and in indoor spaces. There has been a debate, are these large droplets more important or are these small aerosols more important? And basically uh, there is already evidence from uh, research papers that these small aerosols can also dominate in infections in close contact. And uh, when it is very clear if the distance is longer, when these large, large droplets have settled down and only think in the air what can be in indoor spaces are small aerosols. So for this long range uh, transport, aerosols are clearly dominating uh, and are basically only ones but it is highly possible that also in the close range these small aerosols are dominating because uh, there are just so many of these what uh, a human being will exhale and the larger ones yes these will drop quickly uh, to the floor so uh, coming to these transmission routes there are five possible routes uh, described in this slide and these first two are the most important. So close contact is defined often, is it one meter, 1.5 meter or two meter distance? It depends, but basically the meaning is the same. And um, this 1.5 meter has perhaps a bit more scientific background. And this is also uh, a distance where uh, uh, 60 micrometers and larger will drop down before that distance and actually if a partic if a droplet is smaller than 60 micrometer then it will evaporate before it will settle down and then can be carried a bit longer distance by air flows in the room so this is one definition for this 1.5 meter close contact but um, more clear and more important is definition is on the right hand figure where you can see that the concentration is very high in the close proximity and when this concentration of exhaled um, uh, droplets and viruses uh, so this will quickly drop down so that at 1.5 meter the concentration is roughly the same what is um, average concentration in the room and this applies when we have a ventilation and we assume well mixed air distribution and I think this concentration definition is the most important. So basically we have a close range, uh, close contact area where indeed both small and large uh, droplets can have a role but when this long-range airborne uh, transmission, this is by only by aerosols. And these other mechanisms have not been find much evidence. So for this virus, these are not so important. And basically, we can also say that uh, what would be will be uh, measures to avoid this infection. So physical di distance to avoid the close contact and ventilation to avoid this long-range airborne tran transmission will be main measures and uh, hand hygiene for the surface contact but surface contact has, has no evidence for this specific virus. When in the room we typically have some air velocity and uh, in normally ventilated air-conditioned rooms uh, uh, let's say five centimeter per second is uh, quite a small velocity. Indeed, the direction of uh, airflow might be quite random because there is a lot of turbulence. But if one will calculate these settling time and when the 
possible distance with uh, um, aerosols and droplets are carried by the room air flows, then we will see that uh, for, uh, uh, for uh, large particles, these distances are not very big. So if it is 20 micrometers, then it's uh, up to six meters distance traveled. But for 10 micron and 5 micron, these distances will, will be very long. And if there is a higher air velocity, so 0.2 meter per second, then these are even much more longer. So for the smallest particles, these lines are already quite the hor horizontal. So it means they never will settle down and will be carried very long distances by the air flows. So basically, this means that this aerosol transport is something that uh, cannot be avoided with a physical distance. So in normal rooms, uh, they are quite well mixed. We can expect um, equal concentration. And then the only thing is to apply a ventilation or filtration to remove these particles. So um, this is the illustration of how ventilation will work. In the right figure, you can see that um, uh, there is high concentration. Indeed, in the close proximity, this, the concentration is the highest. And then you can expect that these large droplets will settle down. The same applies also in the close proximity in ventilated space. But after that, let's say 1.5 meter distance, the concentration will be equal and then ventilation dilutes and re removes these viruses. So another mechanism what can be used is air filtration. So if we would have air cleaner in the room, so it's another removal mechanism and basically these two will sum uh, so that the airflow rate through the ventilation and clean air delivery rate through the air cleaner can be summed up, and that's the total removal. And the third possible mechanism to remove this virus is uh, this UVG, so uh, UVC radiation, what can be used for the deactivation. And it is important to understand that when we speak about the general ventilation, when we always need to keep this 1.5 meter physical distance. If we want to go closer, then indeed it's possible to apply personal ventilation solutions. And in general environmental infection control pyramid, these engineering controls, meaning mainly these ventilation solutions, are quite high ranked. So these are more important, for instance, than these personal protection measures like masks and so on. So, so these are seen less effective and these ones um, most effective measures. When uh, coming, uh, coming now to buildings and to technical systems and to RIFA guidance, so this was launched originally in the spring last year and now it's already fourth version what is available and has been for the HVAC professionals and other ones dealing with the buildings or making a risk estimates and so so on and mainly it consists of two parts so having a practical guidance what can be easily applied to existing buildings and there is also some discussion how uh, to conduct this risk assessment, uh, calculate the infection probability and what could be more far-reaching actions, uh, so what could be applied in the future buildings and in future ventilation systems. Uh, RIFA has set out uh, uh, 14 recommendations. And these apply for the ventilation rates, how the ventilation is operated. So very many apply for the situation where you have mechanical ventilation system. And in many countries, this is implemented with a heat recovery and when indeed um, recirculation is, is not needed. That seems to be more a European practice 
but uh, for instance in US a lot of recirculation is used and heat recovery is not known so the systems are different and when it's natural but also the guidance is somewhat different when indeed uh, if a ventilation is demand controlled this is not a good good feature for the epidemic where you need a maximum amount of fresh air when this will need to be overruled when there are a set of requ uh, recommendations if there are natural ventilation systems what to do and also dealing with ventilation hygiene like uh, heat recovery equipment uh, recirculation partly hygiene question uh, fan coil split units and um, when some questions what are not so directly linked to that virus but have caused the confusion. So, for instance, what's a correct set point for the relative humidity and does this have any impact on the spread of virus and the infections if there is a humidification or there is no humidification. Indeed, mostly in European buildings we do not use a, a humidification, so it's not very actual, but there have been many questions. Does it have any importance or not? And then finally, indeed, uh, uh, with maintenance and filters and monitoring and so on. So, uh, in let's say in Nordic climate, I am representing. So, the main recommendations, what we have seen most important, are uh, for the ventilation operation time that it should be extended when demand controlled ventilation overruled and uh, systems with recirculation, if used in some countries, when switched over to 100% outdoor air. And with, if that would not be possible, then improve uh, uh, return air filtering efficiency. And also inspection of rotary heat exchangers, which are the most common uh, heat recovery equipment in public buildings in many countries. And then I will come back later to this CO2 sensors, this business what mainly apply, applies for the buildings which do not have mechanical ventilation systems. So to go through some of these recommendations, what we, what REFA has basically recommended, it's uh, uh, in Last year, first guidance was set so that operate ventilation all the, all the time, day and night, and uh, uh, seven hours, 24, seven days, 24 hours, and so on. But this has been changed because there is actually no evidence. And we know now that this virus is only three hours active in the air, so basically no need to operate the ventilation during the night time. And now it's recommended that extended operation time is two hours before and uh, two hours after uh, building occupancy. And in commercial buildings where you can expect higher air change rates, so if free air volumes will be ventilated in one hour, hour when this one hour is enough. So for demand control systems, it's uh, recommended to change the set point to 550 ppm with a thinking that outdoor concentration in large cities can be close to 500 and when you have a 50 ppm accuracy of this sensor so that's the background of that 550 value. Well and indeed there are many buildings there are no mechanical ventilation systems and uh, when it's uh, especially in the winter time indeed a big problem because not so easy to ventilate and not so comfortable to ventilate through the windows uh, but basically there are many recommendations how to use this window ventilation for enough long periods and when to use uh, uh, co2 sensors to use these as uh, ventilation indicators. So uh, these can be relevant in the classrooms, in open plan offices, meeting rooms, uh, if there is no 
mechanical ventilation what is known to be operate at full speed so in such a good ventilation spaces no need to install this but uh, this is a recommendation if naturally ventilated spaces are in the question and be because of epidemic we have recommended lower ppm values than commonly so that uh, yellow will start from 800 ppm absolute value and uh, 1000 will be a limit for the red so if it is higher than 1000 then it's a time to open the to open the window or to leave the room so this is something what can be can help a situation in spaces where uh, where you commonly don't know how well these spaces are ventilated uh, indeed, this CO2 has many limitations. It will take some time, the concentration will build up, and these uh, values, 800,000 ppm, are relevant if we have a normal occupancy. So, so the bottom line is, uh, if one will measure high value of CO2, when there is no doubt that there is a poor ventilation, and, uh, and the room needs to be ventilated, but uh, low CO2, it does not always uh, confirm that there is a low risk of aerosol transmission because a low, low value can be because of a low occupancy or the concentration has not yet built it up in the room. Uh, but still, it seem, seems to be the most simple and uh, so far best indicator we can apply for the uh, air chains of fresh air, of outdoor air in the rooms. Uh, when coming to humidity, and actually there is quite a lot of evidence when we speak about uh, influenza or some other viruses, uh, but this, these effects on the stability of the virus, so uh, this say in the air inactivation, these effects really depend on the specific virus. And uh, actually for SARS-CoV-2, uh, it looks like that uh, low relative humidity has no effect and to have some effect so that the virus will inactivate when very high relative humidities are needed. So more than 80 percent and uh, it's like a wet surfaces wet cleaning will will make a difference when you, when you can really deactivate this virus but cannot be done with humidification so humidification is a is not a method for this virus to reduce um, viability and the same applies for the temperature temperature needs to be very high so room temperature set point has no effect uh, in this case. So basically everything what applies for heating, cooling, temperature, humidity, set points, uh, there is no practical effect and no need to change these set points uh, in epidemic conditions. When uh, what what applies for the ventilation system hygiene, what is indeed important in all conditions, but especially important in epidemic conditions, are leakages in the ventilation system so that extract air, return air can leak to the supply air side and then pollute this supply air and if there are significant leakages then you can expect significant virus concentrations also so all type of a pollutants so gas based pollutants and part particulate matter will follow with air leakages in ventilation equipment and this has been suspected especially for these rotary heat exchangers where you have these uh, uh, moving um, uh, mass in between extract and supply air flows. But there is evidence from these equipment that they do transfer uh, gas phase pollutants. So tobacco smoke is a good example of, uh, of a gas phase transfer 
and applies also for other type of odors. This is well known, but there is also available evidence that these devices do not transfer uh, particulate matter. And uh, this virus will classify as, as a solid particle because in these desiccated expelled droplets, so uh, there is no direct risk for virus transfer via these rotors, but the risk will apply if there are air leakages. And then it is important to, uh, to know what's the technical condition of such uh, uh, heat recovery equipment, because uh, leakage commonly should be less than 2%, but very easily can increase to 20% if pressure, uh, pressures are not correct or uh, seals are not in good order. Uh, so that's uh, that's a reason we have developed together with Eurovent a five-step inspection procedure uh, for rotary heat exchangers, and the recommend recommendation is to conduct this inspection for all uh, rotary heat exchangers if somebody will suspect that uh, these systems do not work correctly, and uh, basically. In both sides of rotor, it is important that the pressure direction is from supply side to return air side. And there are negative pressure values because we are on the suction side of the fans in both sides, but it means that negative pressure, so these values need to be higher in the return air side. And that's a recommendation how to correct these pressure differences if they are not correct. So it is recommended to have 20 pascals minimum. And uh, when it is important that this perch sector of a rotor is correctly functioning, because um, this will assure that these uh, uh, particulate matter will not be transferred. So that's another point. Then the next point uh, is condition of the seals. Uh, so all of these seals are very important and uh, should be checked. Uh, this check is mainly visual check, but when it is also possible indeed to take a leakage measurement. And this leakage measurement can be done in very easy fashion. What you need to do, you just stop the rotor. So if a rotor is not uh, rotating, then this leakage can be directly calculated from the, uh, from, from the temperatures, which are very easy to measure. And that's a good estimate of a leakage, what can be easily measured in field conditions. Just uh, stop the rotor and take a temperature measurements to, to estimate this leakage rate. And this needs to be no more than 2% if the equipment is um, in, in good condition. And in, indeed also other leakages in the air handling units, uh, it's important to check. So, uh, so that's perhaps a very important guidance what uh, applies for all over the Europe because these rotary heat exchangers are very, very popular equipment in all public buildings, office buildings and, uh, and so on. Um, but then the next issue is uh, recirculation and generally indeed it is recommended that in epidemic conditions re recirculation should not be used and uh, so if possible close recirculation damper uh, sometimes can, needs to be done manually sometimes can be done uh, from the BMS uh, but if it is um, heating or cooling capacity issue as it is in many cases when it is recommended to increase uh, outdoor air rate minimum to 50 percent and then improve uh, filtration of a return air so to be sure one will need a HEPA filters but usually this is impossible because of high pressure loss to start to in install such filters then another options are these UVC what can be used 
or when the minimum improvement what is recommended is with EPM 180% filters. So this means uh, filter efficiency 80% or more for particles smaller than one micrometer. So form a F8 filters according to the European classification. And uh, that's perhaps the most common option what has been applied in the practice. So uh, outdoor air rate increased reasonably, so it's at least a 50% and then installing better filters to uh, return air side. What comes to filtration uh, from, let's say, more theoretical point of view? So this is um, uh, the size range of uh, exhaled uh, droplets. So we, we can see that it starts uh, slightly below one micron and then is very high, one, two, three. So let's say this interest range for the filtration from one to 10 micron is very important range. And uh, this is nothing very difficult to filtrate. Uh, so, because this virus is not naked as inside in expelled droplets uh, and behaving as a solid particle, it's very similar to outdoor air filtration, where basically this uh, um, interest range is, is quite a similar. That's the reason uh, for the return air with filters with similar efficiency used for outdoor air have been recommended. So, and indeed, uh, this, is, um, this, this means that uh, virus is easy to filtrate also with high capacity air cleaners, where you just need to have uh, enough air flow rate. So room air cleaners will also benefit from this fact that we are filtrating quite a large uh, solid particles in this case. And uh, HEPA filters are basically not needed even when we speak about public buildings. But indeed, when we will go to hospital setting, when uh, you need to have a, a practically 100% filtration and when we is, uh, let's say, F8 or F nine type of filters are not enough and when the HEPA filters should be applied. But in common spaces, yes, all these uh, uh, common filters, so these old F7, F8, F9 <clears throat> are highly uh, useful for the filtration purposes and the same also applies for the air cleaners. When uh, last year there was quite a lot of discussion what's the uh, situation with the fan coils, split units, which just circulate a lot of air and um, what will happen with a virus. Uh, so actually also these units have some very coarse filters inside and basically have very small filtration efficiency but this is actually some positive effect, some still small removal effect. But the problem typically in such rooms where the fan coils or splits are applied is the outdoor air ventilation. And it's important to check that there is enough outdoor air ventilation when basically window opening is one way. So to open the windows together with the cooling to ensure outdoor air ventilation and then to control this uh, with a CO2 sensor. This is one option and then indeed another more heavy option is installation of a mechanical ventilation system when uh, outdoor air ventilation will be assured. So in our first versions of a guidance it was recommended to stop these fan coil or split units but there has been not found evidence supporting this, so the latest versions of the guidance do not include any more this recommendation. This has, this has been changed, so the main recommendation is to ensure outdoor air ventilation and then it's not a big deal if these units are operated or not operated, so this goes according to the heating and cooling needs then. 
And uh, the same applies for the outer air filtration, which basically is not important in this case because outer air is not a source of the viruses. But indeed, we need outer air filtration for uh, other purposes to protect the equipment, to protect the um, occupants from PM 2.5, so outdoor particulate matter. And um, when it is when it also applies for the filter replacement, but common uh, maintenance schedules and procedures should be applied. So no extra filter replacement is not necessary, but when it is an issue of a maintenance personnel protection, so they, they need to have relevant uh, uh, personal protection because soil filters really can be infected and that's a, that's a risk during the epidemic um, condition actually for any maintenance work. Uh, when coming to the room air cleaners, so these, um, these are another method to remove virus and when it is important that we have enough uh, airflow rate, so this clean air de delivery airflow capacity needs to be at least two air changes per hour calculated with a room volume and there is a positive effect to increase up to five air changes per hour and when you can sum these clean air delivery rate and ventilation, outdoor air ventilation, so that's uh, to estimate the total removal of the viruses. And there is also one specific appendix of our guidance dealing with air cleaners and how to estimate their performance and um, giving also some recommendations. So coming to some challenge, we have still, uh, I think the main challenge is how to calculate in indoor spaces infection probability. And then indeed the next question is how much ventilation is needed? And could this lead in future uh, to some dedicating, dedicated high capacity ventilation systems? So that's indeed a big question. When there are several, let's say, air distribution questions, and uh, as we already discussed with hygiene of ventilation components and recirculation issues. When coming to air distribution questions, when general ventilation solutions, so generally aim to achieve a good mixing, uh, so-called mixing ventilation, but these may be complemented with personal or targeted ventilation solutions. So, but in some parts of the rooms, we try to uh, supply more clean air and to have more clean zones, so lower concentrations. And indeed, there are many possible applications for such personal and targeted ventilation solutions. But this also will apply for the local exhaust these local exhaust effects can be also impo important in the virus concentration reduction. What we have seen last year, so this is very, very famous with Guangzhou restaurant, that was the first case likely uh, reported scientifically, and uh, one infected person here uh, spread a lot of virus and many persons, all these red persons were infected and it was shown that uh, they didn't have close contact before because there were cameras in the elevators and so on. And when it was suspected that this split unit circulated the air and it, it did so because there was a cooling need and indeed a jet throw length very well to the infected person. So infected person hit by air jet and then it will continue to another person's and will circulate. So this uh, was suspected that this propagated the spread of a virus. But when it was measured, what, is the ventilation, what was the ventilation in this space? Actually, there was no ventilation. So somewhere here, it was a toilet and only small exhaust from the toilet was the only uh, ventilation. 
So it was measured to be so low as one liter per second per person. So it can be said that the main issue in this space was the lack of outdoor ventilation. And when this uh, strong air directed airflow, that was a kind of a second issue. But indeed, it's safe to apply low velocity air distribution with good mixing. So it's probably the most robust solution. And we have provided our in our guidance a limit value for the velocity, so 0.3 meter per second, when uh, to be sure that uh, this type of directed air flows can not have an effect on virus spread propagation. When we come to the targeted ventilation, so this can be highly useful in, in the small rooms when you somehow need to uh, separate two people or to make a clean air zones. And this here is a, just a classical personal ventilation solution you can provide for a fixed seat, very clean air, and when indeed a very low concentration and, and so on. But also a separation can have a big meaning. And uh, remember that uh, theoretically, human big inhalation is only 0.3 liter per second but typically we supply 10 liter per second so efficiency in general ventilation is not too good and that's one reason to go to uh, to personal ventilation and sometimes these systems cannot does not need to be too complicated even with a simple fan you can make a separation and shown by numerical studies to have a lot of effect and uh, some such solutions are already available. So for the airplanes already 2013, there was developed a personal ventilation solution. And indeed it's not too difficult, can be implemented to the seats to have a supply and then extract very close uh, to expel, exhale brief. So, that's something what will be very highly useful in the public transport, in, in the trains, airplanes, so on. But unfortunately, no manufacturers have taken this solution into the use. And um, that's something perhaps epidemic situation will change because if this type of solutions would be applied in transportation, then the transportation will be highly safe also in epidemic conditions. So finally, coming to this infection uh, probability calculation, and here the question is that uh, in these reported cases, uh, ventilation rate has been very low, one, two liter per second per person. So commonly we size for 10 liter per second, and also WHO started to recommend this uh, minimum ventilation rate uh, when they published the ventilation roadmap actually it's quite the latest document and um, but but there is no good evidence would that ventilation be enough to uh, reduce the probability of infection so some evidence exists from hospitals but when we operate with 40 liter per second so 6 to 12 air chains per hour but if we do a sizing according to existing standards, so ISO or European standard, when there are like uh, classrooms or meeting rooms in just common buildings today, this four liter second uh, per floor square meter will end up with five air changes per hour. So there are rooms in common buildings where we can expect to have very high ventilation rates which are actually quite close to the hospital ventilation also in common public buildings so that's the motivation to calculate this infection risk what can be done with wells riley model what is quite well known uh, but then needs to be calibrated to specific virus so this can be applied for the common cold or for the influenza or SARS-CoV-2 uh, no difference, these are all airborne viruses, uh, but when this quanta emission rate, this is a virus specific and is also activity specific. So if a human being is sitting, 
making office work, not speaking when virus emission rate is very low, but when it can be 100 times higher if somebody is singing or loudly speaking and also physical activity will increase the emission. So that makes this calculation a bit complicated because we don't know these quantum emission rates so well for this specific virus, but some estimates can be done and uh, RIFA also prepared a very simple ventilation calculator what can be downloaded and uh, uh, so we, this is one example if we have one infected person in the room and when five quanta per hour is estimated emission rate and then we can see very high risk for the eight hour occupancy in small two person office room even well ventilated one so open plan office, if it is uh, not adequately ventilated, the risk will be much higher compared to a good ventilation according to the existing standards uh, when it is already uh, probability less than 5%. And in the classrooms here, you can see that with reasonable ventilation rates, it goes to three or 2%. And when, uh, so it means that in large, spaces there will be a lot of outdoor air ventilation per infected person and that actually is the parameter what matters so room size will affect a total ventilation rate and you typically assume that you have one infected person in the room so it is more safe to be in large well ventilated rooms and comparison for the home ventilation so it's typically 0.5 air changes in homes and these values will be immediately very high and showing that this calculation is very well in line what is reported from other studies so one by us cds reporting that if somebody at home is infected then it is 55 uh, percent of our family members will get with infection within one week. So it's very easy to get from home if somebody is infected. And home ventilation has no capacity because this 0.5 air changes per hour is 10 times less compared for, for instance, with a meeting rooms or a classrooms. So this probability calculation has limitations and basically two limitations because we don't know these quanta emission rates um, not too well yet evidence is quite limited and another assumption is a full mixing assumption what what is typical for this model when applied so in very large and high rooms uh, you can expect to have a concentration differences and when this full mixing assumption does not hold and the concentration uh, can be either uh, smaller or higher depending on on the case and this is indeed another limitation so to conclude there are indeed many possibilities to improve ventilation and to reduce the risk of uh, transmission of such airborne pathogens especially in public buildings and perhaps these will change how we will design future systems because this pandemic has been so massive and there is a lot of discussion but we expect to have some basic protection in in common public buildings what can be recommended today is are these category one ventilation rates recommended in existing standards but it's possible that in future more significant improvements may be needed. So as discussed already regarding these airflow rates, more ventilation is always better, uh, but then what actually matters is the total airflow rate per infected person. And this makes these large well-ventilated well spaces more safe compared to small spaces where you share a room with your uh, colleagues or roommates and in these the risk will be higher 
and it means that the small rooms should be occupied only by one person in such epidemic conditions. It's impossible to apply uh, so high ventilation rates needed to dilute this uh, uh, virus concentration in very small rooms. And indeed, there, is a, there are a lot of research needs, what's uh, proper ventilation capacity regarding related to air distribution, also these cross-contamination issues in ventilation components or in recirculations, and also the use of uh, air cleaners and so on, how ventilation can be better monitored, these could be the first priority. So thank you very much. That was my uh, presentation. Thank you very much, Eric, for a very uh, detailed and comprehensive presentation um, and I think a lot of practical guidance. Um, we've got a, a number of detailed questions coming in and because we're kind of running close to time, I might just take one or two before wrapping up. Um, so one point was regarding uh, the, the comment you mentioned towards the beginning of the presentation on the use of demand control ventilation. And uh, there was a comment here that if people are the source of the virus and demand control ventilation is based on occupancy, why does Riva recommend changing from demand control to constant air volume? Okay, thanks. That's, that's a very good question. So. So basically the thinking is so that um, in your room or even in a building uh, it's, it's a probability that you either will have one infected person in, in the building or in the room. And another option is that you don't have any infected person in the room. And that's the reason you need to run ventilation at the full speed because uh, currently we don't know uh, is there anybody infected person in the building or not. Okay. Thanks very much, Jarek. Um, there's another question here just regarding for smaller rooms, is there merit in locating extract grills at low level to keep droplets at a lower level? like, for example, in an isolation room in a hospital? Uh, yes, isolation rooms operate with 12 air changes per hour. And indeed, um, there is... Um, but when we speak of, about the aerosols, when uh, they, these aerosols basically do not have any settling velocity. Uh, so it's what you can expect is a mixing ventilation and actually the location of air diffusers is not so important. There is indeed some evidence uh, if we will go to larger droplets, so they, these will do settle down and underfloor air distribution is typically not recommended or seen as not good ventilation solution, air, air distribution solution, when you have a particulate matter in the air which will have a settling velocity. But uh, it's, it's very difficult to estimate the impact because uh, we believe that these aerosols will dominate, so it is likely it is much more important what is the ventilation rate, outdoor air ventilation rate or total ventilation rate when you can account also a, a air cleaner. So this will really dominate as a removal mechanism. Thanks very much Eric. I think we'll leave the questions there. Um, for those that we didn't get to, uh, we'll, we'll aim to follow up by email afterwards. Um, but thanks very much for, for everyone that submitted questions so far. Um, so I'm just going to run through a few brief closing announcements before we wrap up. Um, okay, so just firstly, we'd just like to encourage uh, attendees to take a look at ASHRAE's technical committees and get involved uh, where you can. Um, obviously, th these cover a wide, wide range of uh, aspects from, from fundamentals through to, to building applications, indoor environmental quality and controls, and it's free to, to sign up on the ASHRAE website. At a local level, um, 
there is the Ashbury Ireland uh, chapter board and uh, there's a number of vacancies on that at the moment so we're always interested in, in hearing from anyone that's interested in, in volunteering to help out and or AGM is, is coming up soon so if you're interested uh, please do get in touch with myself or any of the uh, board members listed uh, on the, the presentation slides. Um, if you want to stay updated just be sure to uh, that you're registered to our mailing list and um, you can subscribe to us on social media channels, including Twitter, LinkedIn, and YouTube. Lastly, just um, uh, a word of thanks to our sponsors and supporters who help to make ongoing events possible. And again, uh, a huge thanks for, for Yarek for, for coming back to give a, a, an updated presentation on, on Reva's guidance uh, to us today. Um, so thanks again. Um, our contact details are listed on the last slide if you have any, any further queries. And thanks again for your attendance today. Um, enjoy the rest of your day. And thanks very much again, Yarek.